What a delight that so many of you want to hear my story. Of course. And I, hear, I see beautiful ladies with skirts and heels and hose, and here I am in pants. But I think you know I had to wear pants in my career, climbing on scaffoldings, leaning out of airplanes. But I should explain that I am dismantling my studio. I am no longer using my typewriters. I am no longer using my cameras. But I saved this one speed graphic to show you, my old comforting standby when all other mechanisms failed. And you know, sometimes I would have two cameras around my neck and I'd have 50, 100, 200 of these bubble flash bulbs because you had to have backup. Something always went wrong. <laughs> But let me ask you to step back in time so I can explain how I became this famous photojournalist. Well, I used to love going on nature walks with my father in Bound Brook, New Jersey. We would find snakes and turtles. I'd put them under the dining room table. <laughs> Sometimes I would go into school with a snake around my neck, a puff adder. I liked getting attention. My father was a, an engineer. He was refining multicolor printing. He was a perfectionist. Sometimes I would watch him developing photos in the bathtub. Oh, and one time, he took me to a foundry. And I know that is when my love of machines began. There were machine parts being made out of molten steel. And there was the sudden magic of flowing metal and flying sparks and heat and energy and power. I loved that. His philosophy was, never finish a job until you have done it to suit yourself and better than anyone else requires you to do it. And my mother's mantra, reject the easy path, do it the hard way. So with those messages burned in my brain, I began Columbia University, 1921. But that January, my father died suddenly. Well, I was able to continue uh, the semester. I took a photography course from the famous Clarence H. White. I was concentrating on composition and design. I think my father would have loved to have heard about that. Well, then I had to make some money. I was going to be a counselor that summer in nature and photography. So my mother gave me a used Ica reflex camera with a cracked lens. But that didn't matter because pictorialism was in vogue. Everybody wanted their photos to look like paintings. So it worked out. <laughs> and you know, I would set up a little shop and I was selling my photographs to the townspeople, to the staff, to the parents. <clears throat> and then I was given a scholarship to the famous herpetology department at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because, you know, that's what I was going to be, a herpetologist, studying reptiles and amphibians. But when I got to Michigan, well, as life would have it, I fell in love. And um, he was graduating, and we married at the end of that year. The marriage was a disaster. <laughs> Starting with his mother joining us on our honeymoon, <laughs> and then telling me a few weeks later she never wanted to see me again. I really tried very hard. In fact, I stuck with it for two years. But I finally said goodbye to Mr. Chapman and um, finished my college career at Cornell University where I was taking photographs again, and the professors noticed that I was taking photographs of the stone buildings and the library tower and through the grill work, and they thought I should become an architectural photographer. That had not occurred to me. So I went to a New York architectural firm with my portfolio, and they said, well, yes, that would suit you very well. So what I did upon graduation from Cornell is I moved to Cleveland because some of my family was there 
and it was an industrial city just perfect for me. There was Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River. There were bridges and trestles. There was the terminal tower going up under construction. And I would spend hours experimenting with abstract patterns and repeating patterns and, and a sharp difference between dark and light because pictorialism was going out and modernism was coming in. And then I met a man named Alfred Bemis. He was a photographer's assistant in a store, and he admired my talent, and I admired his technical ability. So soon I was hired by the Chamber of Commerce for their monthly magazine. I was hired for um, the Union Trust Bank, but I wanted to get into Otis Steel. I went by that factory every day, and finally, I wrangled myself an interview with Mr. Coolis, 1927, Otis Steele. Well, I believe there is a power and vitality in industry that makes it a magnificent subject for photography. It reflects the age in which we live, and, and the steel mills are the very heart of the industry, with the most beauty, the most drama. Well, it will just be experimentation for now. No, I won't faint. I am not the fainting kind. Well, Mr. Coolis said yes, and then he went off to Europe for a few months. So Beam and I went into that mill every night with the snow behind us and the blistering heat in front of us. I was trying to get the 200-ton ladle pouring out the molten steel but all of that red and orange and all of those sparks and fire, it was all black. And then, miraculously, this friend of Bemis's was on his way to Hollywood with flares. So when we put the flares up, and I took the photo, that white light was the clarity that we needed. And let me show you what I was able to come up with. Yes, the molten steel the heat of it, can you imagine? And then, and then, this photo of the 200-ton ladle won me first prize at the Cleveland Museum of Art. <laughs> well, when Mr. Coolis came back, he offered me $100 a print. It was almost 10 times what I had been getting. I wrote in my diary, I want to do all the things that women never do. I want to become famous, and I want to become wealthy. My jobs have increased. I've been hired by an architectural firm. Chrysler and Republic Steel are interested in my work for advertising. I've opened my own studio in the Terminal Tower, and I've changed my name from Peggy White Margaret White, my father's name, to Margaret Bork White, my mother's maiden name. Has more gravitas, don't you think? <laughs> and then I received a telegram. Have just seen your steel photographs. Can you come to New York within a week at our expense? Henry R. Luce, Time, the Weekly News Magazine. Huh. Well, I knew Time. I wasn't interested in photographing political personages. There were all these trains and boats and factories waiting to be photographed, waiting for me. But I suppose a few days in New York would be all right. So I was interviewed by Mr. Luce himself. Who are you? What are you? Why are you taking these steel photographs? Is this your hobby? Is this your avocation? No, I said. This is my profession, and a very serious one. Well, what they were going to do was launch Fortune magazine that would combine business and industry, and words and photos would be partners, and they wanted me to be the first photographer. So I signed the contract, but not until they agreed to give me, not until they agreed to give me half of the year off for my advertising work and my commission work. <laughs> I wrote to my mother, I feel as if the world 
has opened up to me, and I hold all the keys. But then came the crash. 1929, the stock market crashed. But fortune said they would go ahead, so I moved to New York, and my first job was to photograph the Chrysler building as it was under construction, going to be the tallest building in the world. Sometimes I would be out on the scaffolding in the wind with three men holding my tripod, trying to get shots of the New York skyline or of the Chrysler building. <laughs> oh, and when I saw the gargoyles going up on the 61st floor, I decided that is where I will have my studio. And I did. I was never afraid of heights. I would crawl out on the gargoyle and take pictures. <laughs> My parents saw to it that we were never afraid. <clears throat> you have a car too? <laughs> no. And then, you know, we had to do some backstories for Fortune before it actually got rolling. So I went with the writers to do our stories. I went with Archibald MacLeish to the Elgin Watch Factory, to, with D Dwight McDonald to the Corning Glass Works and with Mr. Luce to South Bend, Indiana, where we did a whole story on the background, back stories of South Bend. And I took this photo. It's plow blades, do you understand? For a plow. And they're about to be painted red. <laughs> and people said I could make things look prettier than they actually were. Some people thought it looked like the Rockettes. Hmm. Then 1930, Fortune sent me to Germany to photograph their rearmaments, the Krupp ironworks and so on, which I did. But I wanted to get into Russia, land of tantalizing mystery. Nobody had been across those borders in years, and they had the five-year plan going on. Well, Mr. Lou said, no, we'll, we'll let you go to Germany. You're never going to get into Russia. Well, I had already applied for a visa. And when the, when the Russians saw my portfolio at the embassy, they said, oh, your pictures will be your passport. But five and a half weeks went by. Finally, a whole cadre of men accompanied me because they finally realized this would be great PR, my photos. So we went to the largest dam. We went to the... To the um, farms, we went to the tractor factory. I had 800 shots ready to send them back to New York. But they had to be developed for the censors. So it took me 36 hours with the last hours in front of my bathtub, rinsing them out and then hanging them up all over the hotel room on clotheslines. They invited me back the next two summers and I will tell you, the people were tired now. They were shabbier. The women were longing for fashionable clothing, for lipstick. And all the children were in nurseries, and they were telling them that Lenin sacrificed everything for them and died of exhaustion. Well then, I came back, and I was doing a lot of advertising work in the early 30s for Buick, for Goodyear Tire. TWA wanted me to photograph their planes flying across their routes. So they put me in a small plane, took off the door, I was strapped in, and I would lean out with my K-20 camera and photograph those gorgeous mosaic farms and the, and the lakes and the trees and the Grand Canyon. You know, I had men falling for me left and right. They like a woman who is independent, who has a career, but who's feminine. But I tried not to get emotionally involved. I always held something back. Oh, you know, in 1933, I sent Amelia Earhart a picture of mine of the George Washington Bridge, and she wrote and said, 
I have just returned to find your gift of the beautiful span. I think you have caught the spirit of the Washington Bridge subtly and exactly. Thank you for sending it as an example of photographic art and also as a demonstration of what ability lurks with women. Sincerely yours, Amelia Earhart. Hmm. Well, then, 1934, I was sent to cover the great drought. They sent me to Nebraska, and I hired a two-seater Curtis Robin airplane because we didn't know how big a problem this was. It wasn't until the next year, 1935, when they called it the Dust Bowl. Well, we discovered it was all the way from Texas to the Dakotas, 16 million acres at this point of over-cultivated soil just blowing in the wind. I wrote my notes for Fortune. This year, there is an atmosphere of utter hopelessness. Nothing to do, no use digging out the chicken coops or the pig pens after the last disaster because the next one will be coming along. Vitamin K, they called it, the dust that sifts under the door sills and grittily seasons every spoonful of food. It gets in the butter and the baby's milk. You know, suddenly it was the people who counted instead of the machines. With these farmers in the Dakotas, I thought, I saw everything in a new light, and I realized maybe I should quit some of this advertising work and become more of a documentarian. And it was perfect timing, because do you know Erskine Caldwell? He had written Tobacco Road and God's Little Acre, and everybody thought he was wildly exaggerating the extreme poverty in the South. He wanted someone to come along and document it. So, it was me. We met in Augusta, Georgia, and um, it took a few days to figure out who was going to be boss. <laughs> but then it got so I really, I loved watching Erskine work. He had this quiet, receptive approach. He would wait until the subject revealed his personality, and then he would start the interview. He could mimic the inflection of any southern state we were in. I was the northerner. I would stay in the background. And then when everyone was comfortable, I would come in for the picture or use my remote. And we wrote this book together. You have seen their faces. And it's interesting because people said it looks almost as if pictures tell the whole story. Um, seem to have lost the one picture I wanted to show you. Anyway, um, the reviewers said, you know, pictures tell the story, and it's as if the words are supplemental. Hmm. So all through Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, for five months we traveled and took these photos. And Erskine and I fell in love. <laughs> so that was 1936. And something else major happened that year. Mr. Luce decided he would launch one more magazine, and he would call it Life. He hired the first four photographers, Alfred Eisenstadt, Margaret Bork White, Thomas Stackpole, and Peter, Peter McAvoy. So, I think that's wrong. Peter McAvoy and Thomas Stackpole. Anyway, um, we were each sent out on our special assignments, you know, so that they could have stories ready. And I was sent to New Deal, Montana to photograph the Fort Peck Dam. <laughs> now, I discovered Fort Peck is this frontier town. Looks like a movie set. There were quack doctors. There were fancy ladies with boas. Everyone would go to the bar X at night. The bartender would put her baby on the bar. I was photographing all of that, and life sent me a telegram, quite concerned about what I was doing. I said, don't worry. 
I'm still taking the shots that you want. Here's the, the diversion tunnels for the Vort Deck Peck Dam and all kinds of construction pictures that I took. And I won the inaugural cover of Life magazine, November 1936, the Fort Peck Dam. And what they put into the uh, magazine was, photographer Margaret Burke White had been dispatched to the Northwest to photograph the multi-million dollar projects of the Columbia River Basin, as only Burke White can take them. What the editors got was a human document of American frontier life, which to them was a revelation. Well, what we had created was the new photo essay, where photos tell the whole story. And then they sent me to the, to the Arctic tundra <laughs> to accompany the Governor General of Canada as he was going about in a steamboat meeting his constituents. And what should happen at one of the first stops? Someone came on board and said, does anyone fit this telegram? Honey child, Arctic Circle, Canada. Why can't you come home and marry me? Erskine. <laughs> Honey child, Arctic Circle, the next stop. I can't go on. I need you. Come home. <laughs> Honey child, I love you. I miss you. Oh, <laughs> oh you know. We had talked about this often. The secret of life for me in the midst of rushing events is to have a sense of tranquility. I had chosen a life that dealt with tragedies, mass calamities, human suffering, human triumphs. In order to record that and understand what I was recording, I needed to have a sense of serenity as kind of balance. I couldn't have somebody constantly wishing that I would come home. <laughs> well, oh then, you know, um, I was invited to the White House and I took photographs of the president and I sent a letter um, with all of the photos to the secretary and I said, enclosed are many photos of the president and his staff and especially one for the electrician who said, they always promise, but they never keep their promise. I want to be the exception. And then Mrs. Roosevelt asked if I would come to the White House and photograph the whole family. And she sent me a message saying, artist, genius, wonder woman. I have never seen such pictures. They are really extraordinary. I hope we didn't wear you out, everyone firing questions at top speed. Do come and see us again when you have the time to spare, and we can just sit around. <laughs> Sincerely yours, Eleanor B. Roosevelt. Well, I have to ask you, do you think Eleanor B. Roosevelt ever had time to just sit around? <laughs> I doubt it. She was a wonderful woman. <laughs> And then, 1937, they sent me to cover the Louisville flood. I got the last plane in, and I had to thumb a ride on a rowboat to get into town. The Ohio River had overflowed its banks, and all of the people in the low-lying areas had been flooded out and lost everything. I came upon this bread line, and You know, I took this picture for the flood, not because we were in the Depression, but we were. And we found out that there were hundreds of these billboards all across the country, sponsored by the National Association of Manufacturers, who were telling people that everything was fine, that we were doing well, we had the highest wages and the shortest hours. And <laughs> You know, the, the Farm Security Administration photographers like Dorothea Lang and Arthur Rothstein started going around the country looking for these ironic situations. She went out to California on Route 99 and found a squatter's camp with a huge billboard, America has the highest standard of living. 
And down in the south, Arthur Rothstein found um, a billboard of a train and all the people are leaning out the window, relax, take the train, with the migrant workers trudging underneath. So yes, we were in the Depression. And as America was facing the Depression, the Europeans were facing the growing war clouds in Europe. So I was sent to Czechoslovakia. Erskine came along. We were going to write another book together. And we came upon this situation. Now, I don't think you can even really see this picture because the, the copy didn't come out well. It's thousands of people saying, Heil Hitler. And this is in Bohemia, Czechoslovakia. And this is Sudeten Germans being whipped up into believing that they are a repressed minority. You know, in Czechoslovakia, this land of readers, all the bookstores were closing, the newspapers were vanishing, the beautiful liberated theater in Prague was ordered to close. I was arrested and almost jailed because they thought I was a spy with my cameras. Erskine and I finally eluded our um, escorts and we were able to start interviewing people, but something I haven't told you, he has these moods and you know, we'd be in the middle of an interview and then he would just freeze people out and they would think, well, what, what did I do? But anyway, we managed to write a book called North of the Danube. And now you're going to think I'm an idiot, but I, when we came home in 1939, I married him. <laughs> <laughs> I decided maybe if I marry him, he won't be so desperate to be with me every second. So we were married in Silver City, Nevada, after he signed my contract that said he could not attempt to take me away from my assignments and he would try to control his mood swings. <laughs> so 1941, the Nazis and the Russians had formed a non-aggression pact, but my editor, Wilson Hicks, was sure that the Nazis were going to break that pact, and he wanted me to be in Moscow before any other reporter. And so Erskine came along. He had his own reporting to do. We, we could not go through Europe. We went through China. It took us 30 days. And remind me at the end to show you my life photograph of Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Anyway, we did get into Moscow just as the just as the Nazis were attacking the Kremlin, we had an, a hotel room directly across from the Kremlin. Now this was gorgeous. It was spectacular, I have to tell you, as well as terrifying and so noisy. You just wanted to go down into the subways. But I did not do that because this was my job. So whenever they came around looking to make sure everyone was out of the building, we would go under the bed. You know, one time, Erskine was uh, going off to do a radio interview, and I took my cameras over to the embassy and put them up on the roof, and I was getting ready to photograph, and then I heard something coming, and you know, when something's coming in, you, the whole atmosphere changes. And so I grabbed my camera and went in against a wall, and all the, all the windows in the embassy blew in. And that night, I actually did have to go down in not such good shoes, all the way down in broken glass. Anyway, all this time, I was trying to arrange an interview with Stalin. And finally, uh, Harry Hopkins, Roosevelt's envoy, arranged it for me. So I came in. Here was Stalin. He was much shorter than I thought. <laughs> and all pockmarked, not at all what you see on these giant posters all over the country. He was stiff as a rail. He looked like he was made out of concrete. I said, would you like to sit down? Nothing. Um, I said, remember I took photos of your mother in the 1930s? Nothing. So I started getting my things together, and I suddenly dropped this whole pile of bubble flashbulbs. So as I was crawling around, 
picking them up, he burst out laughing. And I grabbed my camera and got this shot with just the hint of a smirk left on his face. So. Now, 1942, we were in the war now. They sent me over to England so I could photograph the B-17s, the flying fortresses, as they came over to England. And I got a telegram from Erskine <laughs> asking for a divorce. <laughs> well, that was not unexpected. We had three good years with many, many, many tempests. He was moving to Hollywood. I was not going to move to Hollywood. I have to tell you, this was a huge relief. <laughs> <laughs> and I have always said, work is something you can count on. It is a lifelong friend that never deserts you. So I asked General Doolittle if I could go on a bombing mission. He said, no, that's too dangerous, but you can go on a troop ship. So there I was on a troop ship. <clears throat> Uh, going across to Africa in my newly accredited Army Air Force uniform, first female photographer, World War II. There were 6,000 British and American troops, 400 nurses who envied my pants, the first five wax, and Kay Summersby, Eisenhower's driver. There were rumors that we were being stalked by a submarine, and about the third night in, we were hit by a torpedo. I grabbed my bag, threw out all my clothes, put in my Linhoff camera, my Roli, my best lenses, um, rolls of film. I had the life belt over my shoulder. I had my helmet on my head. We all got in line. Everybody was very calm. We had rehearsed this twice a day. Then I got into lifeboat number 12, which was half filled with water. And um, when we got down, it was so turbulent, and we figured we had no rudder. Then all of the other ships in the flotilla moved away. They didn't want to bring attention to us. We could see our ship going down. One of the other lifeboats capsized, and we took in a nurse with a broken leg. I tell you, I think this is the only time I was ever actually afraid. You could hear some lifeboats going by in the dark singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy. When... Oh, finally in the morning, a British plane went by, everybody waved, and I got out my cameras. So we were saved. And who should be the first person I see on land in Africa but Jimmy Doolittle, <laughs> General Doolittle, who said, Maggie, you want to go on a bombing mission? <laughs> I said, you know I do. I'm not going to stop asking. He said, well, you may as well. You've been torpedoed. <laughs> so now, here I was. I had lost everything on the ship. The Signal Corps loaned me this high-altitude flight suit and the K-20 camera, and they said, don't take off your electric mittens over 15,000 feet or you're going to lose your hands. And we had to have oxygen masks over 10,000 feet. You know, there are 10 men on a bomber. It's very crowded. Uh, so General Atkinson was climbing and diving and swerving, and, and we were going from place to I was trying to go from window to window. I've been through that in aerial photography. It wasn't until we landed I realized we were being shot at. Well, the mission was a success. They, they bombed a crucial airfield in Tunis, Tunisia. Well, I've been keeping up, um, well, a correspondence with General Atkinson. I wrote to him the other day and said, hi, General. Speaking of battle jackets makes me sad because mine was sunk. I understand I'm getting another. 
Well, then, you know, some of you may have relatives who were in the Italian campaign. I was there for five months, Casino Valley and other places. And then, as the war was winding down in Germany, 1945, I was assigned to General Patton's Third Army. I had already been photographing from the sky all of the bombed out cities in Germany. And then we came upon Buchenwald. It had been liberated the day before, and I asked these men to stand behind the gate. You can see there is not a, an ounce of em emotion in any face, and you all know what, why that is, and what they were seeing, and what we were seeing. General Patton was so incensed that he sent his MPs to a nearby town to bring back 1,000 civilians to see what their leaders had done. They brought back 2,000. People ask me, you know, how can you photograph these atrocities? And I think it's, you know, I think the camera is like a barrier in between so that I'm not quite seeing what I'm photographing. Anyway, after this, I went to Essen and stayed in uh, Alfred Krupp's castle. They had him under, under guard in the maid's quarters, and he came up for me to interview him and photograph him, and they used that in the Nuremberg trials. So I think you're tired of hearing about the war. I was tired after five years of photographing the war. So in 1946, they sent me to India to photograph Mahatma Gandhi. Now this was a country on the threshold of freedom from Britain, and Gandhi was telling his people, you need to spin and weave so we can make our own clothes and we won't have to import from Britain. So when I went for my first interview with Gandhi, they told me I had to learn how to spin. So deadline or no deadline, I learned how to spin. And then I prepared to go in to speak to him, but I had to follow the rules, and Monday was a day of silence. So I could not speak, and they said I could only take three, three flashes because he does not like light. So I got ready, I took, I took my first flash. It, it didn't work, I don't know, it was too damp or something. I took the second flash, that worked, but I forgot to pull the slide. So I took the third flash, and that worked. And I got this picture of Gandhi, and you know, his, his creed is nonviolence. And so the spinning wheel is the perfect weapon. I accompanied him to Simla for the Freedom Talks and back to New Delhi where he lives with the untouchables. And um, he always talked of a united India where the Muslims and the Hindus would get along together. But Muhammad Jinnah wanted the Muslims to live in an area of Pakistan. So there, were violent, there was violence and clashes and you've all seen those stories as well. I went back home to the States and did a great deal of research on India. And then in 47, I went back, photographed the, the wealthy, the untouchables, and this huge, great migration with all of the Muslims heading into a Pakistan and all of the Hindus and Sikhs coming down into India. Gigantic thousands of people in both directions. We talked about the caste system and land reform and always non-confrontation. He had just come off a six-day fast. He always fasted to say, stop the violence. And that night, on his way to evening prayer, he was shot and killed 
by a Hindu fanatic. Well, then, you know, uh, I went to South Africa on a shoot, and I went to Korea and did a nice little story. There were plenty of photographers in Korea covering the war, but I wanted to do a human interest story, and I found one. There was a young man who had left the South Korean army to join the North Korean army because they paid more. And then he realized his mistake and came back out. So he was going to be escorted back to his South Korean town, and I came along. So this was going to be difficult. His brother thought he was a traitor. You know, everyone in the town was wondering about him. But we got back to the town and, and finally made peace with his brother. And then he saw his wife and the, and the baby he had never seen. But the story was his mother, and she was in another village. And you know, when you're a photographer, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And now the light was going, first of all, and the mother wasn't there. But suddenly everyone saw, coming through the fields far off, somebody coming along with a stick. And she came and came, and then pretty soon you saw her stop and drop her stick, and then Jim curled Jin, and they ran together, and I got these wonderful pictures of them hugging, and she was singing lullabies to him because she thought he had died. And it was a beautiful story, and it also proved that I am not a communist <laughs> because I had been accused of being a communist. <clears throat> I did not come before McCarthy, but I thought that was one way, maybe, to prove it. And while I was in Korea, I noticed my left <clears throat> arm and left leg were beginning to feel heavy. So when I came back to the United States, I went to a series of doctors, and nobody seemed to know, or they weren't telling me. Finally, they did tell me that I have Parkinson's disease. Um, I don't have the shaking palsy that so many people have, but I have lost a bit of my balance. And um, I've thrust myself into exercises. I wad up newspapers. I wring out wet towels, you know, to keep me stronger. I walk four miles a day. The doctors are amazed. In fact, Dr. Irving Cooper is going to operate on my brain. And Alfred Eisenstadt, my colleague at Life, is going to photograph the operation and the exercises. And um, people say, why don't you just accept your situation? And I think, well, no, I feel just the opposite. My ethic has always been hard work, and, and the best praise I could ever get from my editors was, Maggie won't take no for an answer. <laughs> so I'm working hard, and what I want you to do is keep up your subscriptions to life so you can see this. It's all going to be in there, the whole thing. And I, I thank you very much for coming this evening, and thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. Wow. Thank you. What a grand lady, don't you think? Thank you so much for coming. You're a very nice audience. Everyone was just riveted, you know? Because isn't this amazing? Yeah. And oh. so many people I'm telling about my new show, and they don't know who she is. And that's the whole point of me going around, you know? Think, I mean, she was ahead of the men in a lot of this. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Did you ever work in color? And, um, I wasn't very good with color, um, so I stuck with black and white. I worked with it a little bit in the, in the early 50s. But um, I have a letter from Ansel Adams right over here, actually. Um, I have a whole lot of things on this table for you to see. And he is explaining to me how to use a light meter. <laughs> and this is in 19... 1956, 1936, what, who's got good eyes? 
56. So see, 56, she was stopping taking photos by then, almost. Um, the people said they found drawers full of light meters, you know. She was not the brilliant technician at all. She saw the picture and she knew how to get the composition, but she wasn't so perfect at the rest of it. That's the truth. Um, but more questions. Uh, yes? Um, my mother thought it was pretty impressed, but I, um, I never felt that I got quite enough attention from my mother, actually. That's the bottom line on that. Um, but I will tell you what happened. Um, when I was going up on one of those TWA shoots where I would be in the plane, um, I invited a bunch of my friends to be in a plane and my mother so that they could be in this plane and I would be shooting, here's a TWA plane. And she was taking, she was a very brilliant woman. She learned Braille and she was teaching at the school for the, Peabody School for the Blind in Boston and all. So she was taking a course right then and she got up to come to get on the plane and had a heart attack and died. But anyway, um, so my parents had a huge work ethic, as you could hear. Um, they wanted things to be done perfectly. And you worked until you got it perfect. And that's pretty much what I did. Yes? Do you ever use the speed graphic? I don't. Um, are you talking to Margaret? or? Um, um, <laughs> I, Margaret used the speed graphic, yes, uh, a great deal. This speed graphic does not work. Um, I, you know, people want me to take a flash, and it would be very exciting, but I, I bought it from a man who was um, going into a nursing home, and he put all his cameras up for auction. And um, so I took this to, so I bought this, and I took it to a special camera shop with these great old guys, you know, who know everything. And they tried and tried and tried, and it's got too many things broken. So I can't do it. But I will tell you, when I did an audition for the New Hampshire Humanities Council, I had blue bulbs in, and someone came up and said, you know, blue bulbs didn't come in until the 60s. <laughs> so I had to put them in. <laughs> so I am not, um, I am not a photographer. So, I hope that doesn't matter. <laughs> yes? When you uh, walked into Moose, did you ever do any independent shooting? Did you ever appear in Saturday Evening Post or Look or any other magazine? Well, um, once in a while I got fed up with Henry R. Luce, and um, in 1940 I quit life, and I went to work for PM newspapers. And... Um, Worked for them for about a year, and, but then realized that wasn't working out so well either, so I came back to life. Um, but yes, those first early years, I was doing a ton of commissioned work for other people and advertising work uh, in the early 30s. Um, but mostly life, because Henry R. Luce really liked me. Uh, he liked the fact that not only was I a good photographer, but I was constantly in the news myself because I was this woman on tops of skyscrapers and going on bombing missions, and it made a great story. So he gave me a lot of the best stories. Um, so I stuck with fortune and then with life. And so I came back, and even as I was getting sick, they kept me on staff for a long time. So, yes? Did you ever take many pictures of GIs in the combat. I don't see any combat pictures. Yes, well, there's some combat pictures here. Um, this is a book that Sean Callahan put together. There are some co combat pictures, and here's Patton. Um, uh, but the thing is, one of my major combat stories was in Casino Valley. It was called Purple Heart Valley in Italy. And there were medics 
and I was taking pictures of the medics, you know, with flashlights trying to operate, and we and the nurses and everyone would have to dive into the mud every time something came because the Germans were all around the edges on top and we were in the valley, which is a disaster. And so I took all of these shots and I interviewed all of these soldiers. We had such, such a show. And I sent it all back because it, oh, here's the great migration in India. I sent it all back because it had to go to the um, Pentagon for censorship. And that particular batch, they lost. And I even went down there and searched the entire Pentagon. They lost this whole, that whole campaign. So things happened in those days. It's very different than what it is now, you know? This is a wonderful book. I got it, you know, one of those used books on Amazon because you can't get a lot of the books anymore. I don't know if I should show you. Some of these you don't want to see. Um, What's the name of the book? It's called The Photographs of Margaret Burke White, and it's by Sean, S-E-A-N. Here she is. Isn't she beautiful? Um, Callahan, Sean Callahan. Yeah. You know, Margaret had a lot of secrets. And um, if you read her autobiography, you have one story. If you read her biography by Vicki Goldberg, you hear a lot of other stories. The fact is, first of all, when, she, when her father died, when she was 21, she found out she was Jewish. Now that is very interesting because, well, she kept it secret, and you can see why. Because in the 20s, weren't there quotas? You couldn't get into college, probably, remember? If you were Jewish. So she kept that quiet. And then she never told anyone about her first marriage or the fact that she was divorced, because you don't want to be a divorcee either. I mean, things were different in those days. You didn't just blab. You kept things quiet. So she had a whole myth about herself, even how old she was. It kind of seemed like she just came out of college and was suddenly this fabulous photographer. And actually, she had learned photography from her father a little bit, from her first husband, from Michigan, from Cornell. She didn't just pop up out of nowhere. So that was all part of it, I guess. You know, she was this fascinating woman. Where did she come from? Yes. Did you ever know Edward R. Murrow or photograph him or anything? No, I don't. I didn't find anything out about Edward R. Murrow, but she was on, um, she probably was. She was on radios with um, Susan Stamberg or somebody. Um, no. <laughs> None of those names have I come across, but I did run across a, a radio interview. She has two nephews who are still alive, Toby White and I forgot the other man. And um, I went through their emails and came upon a, a radio interview of hers, which was kind of nice. And you know, you can go on the web and, and listen to Eleanor Roosevelt and listen to Amelia Earhart. It's really interesting. So you can hear what they sounded like. Um, Margaret sounded much more refined than I did. She sounded much more, well, I was planning to go, and I was planting my garden. But I could not bring myself to do that and be this excited person. I couldn't get that. You know what I mean? So I just had to do pretty much my own voice, I guess. Um, but she was exciting. I, would, I wouldn't have a billionth of her courage or, or ever asked to go on a bombing mission or, you know? She was very brave. Yeah. What, what in addition to her parents being um, demanding perfection and working very hard, what do you think went <coughs> into her wanting to defy tradition because nice Jewish girls get married and have children? <laughs> Um, well, it was early. I think it really was early 
watching her father with the developing and going to that foundry. I mean, why else would a woman want to go in a steel mill? She got, you know, some girls go on horses and they like horses. She went to a foundry and she liked that excitement of that heat and sparks. How can you explain that? I don't know. But that's what she liked. And she figured out pretty soon that this was very, she was going to be famous. Remember, she said, I want to be famous and I want to be wealthy. Yes, well, <laughs> that's another story too. Um, when I, I went to Syracuse University, that's where all her papers are, which is funny because she never went to Syracuse. She went to four other universities, but not Syracuse. But they asked her if she would donate them, and she said yes. So I did my research there and um, came upon all these things in the 30s where she was in arrears all the time to Kodak. And there would be a letter from Kodak, Dear Miss, Miss Burke White, um, we still need the $400, blah, blah, blah. And then writing back her secretary, Dear Kodak, um, we, as you know, we're still waiting for another job to come. And it was just letters and letters and letters. Everyone was so nice then. You didn't call up and say, get your money. You know, <laughs> letters, lovely letters for weeks and months. And, but, and partly because she just kept buying more equipment and she also tried to buy a lot of nice clothing because people said, you know, if you're going to get a job, you need to be very well dressed and everything. So she was always, as her biographer said, she was always over her head, <laughs> both in her work and also in her finances. She was always over her head. So, and you had a question. How long did she keep her diary? Um, well, this, um, she kept the diary. Well, I just, I just found letters and letters and letters and, um, and notes and notes, and I didn't even find half of it. The biographer was able to interview people. He, she was able to interview a whole lot of the life staffers, and that makes for very good reading, I advise you. Up here, I have my bibliography, so it, it has some great books and also the different places that um, Margaret Burke White is going to appear, um, and some more books for you to look at, and Madame Chiang Kai-shek, too. So, I mean, she really did meet all of the famous people of her day and did a good job of it. So, yes? For all the things you did in the air, did you ever learn to fly a plane? No. No, never, never learned to fly a plane. I just like to go out with the pilots. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So you talk about a few people that were mentors for her. Were there some women photographers that she was a mentor for in the later era? Well, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I have, because I'm really trying to learn, I've made a list of all the different female photographers starting in the 1800s and coming down, and many of them mentored each other. Margaret, Margaret wasn't very friendly. She was after, she had her eye focused on what she was doing, and she was going from job to job. So people now can look at her work and learn a lot from her. <sighs> But she didn't exactly take the time to spend, I'm afraid to say. Gertrude Casbier, if you've ever heard of her, was a great mentor to some of the people who came along. Dorothea Lang wrote her some lovely letters. Um, they were trying to swap books with each other and all. But mostly she, I wouldn't say she had very many friends. She had some males that she you know, partied with and had fun with. But when she was sick, at the end, there was really nobody. How old was she when she died? Well, uh, 67. But she was like 48 when she got, 50 when she got it. So there were 19 years of slowly, slowly, slowly. So many more people would know about her if she'd had that extra 10 or 20 years. Can you imagine? I mean, 48 or 50. So where did she, 
Where did she really learn her photography? <laughs> um, or was it self-help? She learned it from, a little bit from her father, but she never said that. She learned it from her first husband. While they were at Michigan and then they went to Purdue, she learned a lot from him. But she put him aside and never talked about him again. And then she went to Michigan. Uh, when she was at Michigan, they wanted her to be the photo uh, editor already. So somehow she already knew a lot after her first year of college. Oh, she took that course from Clarence H. White, and that is very important. When you hear about any of the other famous photographers of her day, they all studied under Clarence H. White in New York City. And where so was he? he? He was in New York, okay. and he was at Columbia, and he was giving lessons to a lot of famous okay. photographers. So she learned a lot in those early years. Yes? Um, it was competitive. Some of the editors made it competitive. They did it on purpose. They made it competitive. Um, so yes, you were always hoping to get that, that shoot or that shoot. And well, I have to say, Alfred Eisenstadt said she was hugely talented, but nobody liked her. <laughs> so that's kind of sad. But that may be extreme. I mean, lots of people liked her. This man, Sean Callahan, loved her. He, he was a young man when she was struggling with, Al with Parkinson's, and he came to put this book together while she was already getting very infirm and getting, having trouble talking and everything. And he admired her so much. And so did tons of other people. And Ansel Adams, um, invited her out to Yosemite when she was very getting ill or sicker, and um, he kept in touch with her. Dorothea Lang said, Dorothea Lang, by the way, had polio. Do you know who she is? She, she's the one who had the migrant mother. Remember that hugely famous depression picture? Um, she wrote and said, you are so, let's see, where is that? Um, I don't know where that is, but um, Dorothea Lang had polio when she was young, so she had one leg that limped all the time. So she knew what it was like to be infirm, and she wrote and said, you're so brave, Margaret, because what her biographer says is she, she made up for anything she did wrong in her life by that last 19 years where she just fought and fought and fought and never complained and really was a good model for this is how you fight an illness. So she was very much admired by all of the photographers by then. Yes? Why in your presentation don't you reveal more about her not being likable and being unfriendly? Because how do I do that? How? I don't know, but it only came out. I know, but I, I've, I've been through a lot of discussion in my brain about it. And I finally came to the conclusion that I want to be the Margaret that the public saw. And then I will tell you what she was really like. Because it's hard to tell you that I'm not friendly. <laughs> but So I'm giving you the, the bubbly, effervescent, the face that she put on all the time. And then I like to tell. Yeah, she thought she, she thought she was delightful, and, and really, I mean, she was. She was, very, she was very, people said she was very fun, but she didn't have a sense of humor. But you know the difference? She, she was fun, she was good at a party, but um, not necessarily a sense of humor. Yes. Yeah, it, it was a story of her professional life, right. Yeah, it, I've learned a lot doing this. The first time I did it, I showed the photo and then turned it around. And at the end, people said, no, no, you've got to keep them out. So, you can, so that was a very good tip. 
So if you do have tips for me, I appreciate them, but that, that particular one, um, I, I guess I don't agree with. So I, it sounds to me as if, from, from all of us, as if he was an incredibly driven person. Exactly. Driven. And focused. does come through in the presentation. Okay. So you can see how driven she was? Yeah. Did she have a husband? She had two short husbands. <laughs> two, two, two short husbands. <laughs> yeah. I, I suppose each one of us will link into the things where we have been. And, and I was, had the chance to be in India for two years when Rahul and Nehru had its second uh, uh, time going through for an election. But uh, I was a very big fan of Gandhi. And to have heard you say that about Gandhi and her being there, and uh, she must have taken an awful lot in. Yeah. She wrote six books. So every time she was on one of these major trips, then she wrote a book and went on lecture tours. So she was hugely... She wrote six books. She wrote six books, two, with, wow. two or three with um, Erskine Caldwell, but the rest by herself. They're hard to get now, but um, yeah. But her, her autobiography is delightful, and the biography is hugely illuminating, too. So thank you, you've been great. Thank you.